Anyway, we are very pleased today to have David Scheitz with us to do a, he calls, he calls his show Clean Poverty Show. And David is down from New Hampshire. And uh, he is a former bookseller, independent bookseller, who, who sold uh, books to schools. And now he has a hobby. He goes around to senior centers and does his own little brand of comedy. So I'm going to give him this, and I'm going to try to get Chris to turn this down. No, don't turn it down, Tina. Don't turn it down. Don't turn it down. אם אתה רוצה לנסוע למוכנית שלי, אני חושב שזה בסדר גמור. אני לא מדבר עברית. או, אני חושב שאני מדבר עברית. 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 Ich würde später sagen, das ist gut. Anyway, my name is David, David Shikes. I live in New Hampshire, and uh, as she says, I do go to uh, senior centers all over Massachusetts. You have the distinction, I must tell you, in the state of Massachusetts as being the only state in the country that can make the claim that you have a senior center in every, every single town. You cannot name a town in this state that does not have a council. I can name one town, the town of Monroe, which is way out in Western Mass. Every other town has, they don't necessarily have their own building or their own you know, place to meet like you do, uh, like Stowe in Stowe and I think in Carlisle, in um, some of the towns that I've been to, Ashfield, which is way out in Western Mass, they, they meet in a church. Or you know, or in a community center. This is a fabulous location, incidentally. I think uh, I was here about three years ago in the evening. We had a supper here, and I had a nice group. Some of you may have been. Um, and I don't change my menu too much, which is great because the seniors never remember, you know, from. <laughs> but I came to uh, to make you smile a little. But I'm going to start out on a serious note for a second. And my cardiologist at Mass General Hospital told me that it was a nice, she, she really approves of my starting out on a serious note. When I told her that I was offering a few words to my seniors before I tried to make them giggle a little bit, um, there's nothing more boring than to hear about somebody's health history. Um, so I'm going to try not to bore you, but there's a point a very, a very valid point, I think, to my bringing this up for a second. I'm the guy that's run five Boston marathons, and um, I'm in the woods taking trees down, and I take, I take three-mile walks, five-mile walks. I do a lot of physical stuff, but I was sitting at home a year ago in February talking to one of the directors of one of the senior centers, in this case it was in Worcester, and just sitting at home on the phone, and suddenly, out of nowhere, I felt chest pains. So I called 911. Our Atkinson, Atkinson, New Hampshire is where I live. Our voluntary group came over immediately. They were there within two minutes. They rushed me to Lawrence General Hospital. The ER doctor took a CAT scan and an EKG and said, David, it's not your heart, it's your aorta. We can't help you here. You've got to go to Boston. Where do you want to go? I said, I want to go to Mass General. So on a Friday afternoon, during rush hour, I got an ambulance number two. 35 minutes later, I arrived in Boston at Mass General. The surgeon met with me and told me that he was going to perform an operation. He was wearing a turban. I knew right away he was a Sikh from, from India. He was really, really a class act. Just, just by listening to this man for 20 seconds, you know that you were dealing with the best of the best of the best. He performed an eight-hour surgery on me, closed up the aorta, changed the aortic heart valve, and here I am. But why am I telling you all? He told me that running the marathon, may, stuff like that may have helped me. 
And I am pushing 80, 80 years old. I'm not quite 80, but almost. And so, um, you know, the age factor. But I, I asked him, you know, why do you have things like this? Why do these things appear? Nobody really knows. They suspect that it's maybe genetic, but they don't. But why am I telling you all of this? It's one simple reason. We're in Concord. You're right in the throes of the best hospitals in the world. If you think that something is happening to you, you're in the theater, you're watching a show, you're at home watching TV, you're in a restaurant, you're driving. If you think something's happening to you and you're not sure what it is, don't just do what senior citizens usually do. Oh, I'll go lie down, it'll go away. If I went to lie down for even half an hour, we wouldn't, I wouldn't be talking to you right now. That's how critical some of these things can be. This came out of nowhere. This is the Boston Marathoner that suddenly has an aorta uh, a dissection. I mean, who knows? The point is very simple. If something is happening to you, do something about it. You're within minutes of the best hospitals, never mind Massachusetts, the best in the country are just within minutes of Concord. So that's the message for the day. Take care of business. I know that you know this already, but when you hear it from the outside, it doesn't hurt. And I just went through this, it was frightening, but thank goodness for Mass General Hospital. I can't say enough about that place. You know, incidentally, when you go to the hospital, the first thing they insist on doing is putting one of those really skimpy Johnnies on you. <laughs> so now you know where ICU comes from. <laughs> So I have to tell you about an elderly lady who was sitting at home knitting. She lived in this big old house by herself. She was sitting and knitting one day and suddenly all the lights went out. All the lights went out because she could not afford to pay her electric bill. So she went into the attic, she grabbed a little, grabbed a little oil lamp from her childhood. She's sitting and rubbing it clean and as she does so a genie comes out offers her three wishes. She says, well, first of all, I want you to surround me by so much money that I never have to worry about paying another bill. Secondly, um, I want you to change me into a young, beautiful woman. And lastly, I want you to change my cat into a young, handsome prince. There's a big puff of smoke when it settles down. She looks around, she sees bags and bags of money everywhere. She looks into the mirror, she sees a young, beautiful woman. A few seconds later, a young, handsome prince walks through the door, holds her in her arms and says to her, now aren't you sorry you brought me to the vet for that little operation? <laughs> uh, well, since we're in Tua, sort of a, 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 a political situation right now. I don't know if any of you watch CNN or MSNBC or whatever, but uh, they seem to bring up politics mm, like every two minutes. So I have to tell you that uh, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, and Donald Trump all passed away. They went up to heaven. God greeted them in heaven and said to them, you know, uh, I'm not going to just invite you into heaven without qualifying you first. There has to be a qualification phase. Well, they weren't very happy, but they're all the way up there. What are you going to do? So he talks to Hillary first. He says, Hillary, what have you done on earth that's so special that I should invite you into heaven? Hillary says, well, early on, I worked on behalf of lots and lots of children's causes. I tried assisting our president to the best of my ability. I'm a former Secretary of State. God said that's enough, I'm impressed. Sit on my left side. Barack Obama comes up. Barack, what have you done that's so wonderful that I should invite you into heaven? Barack Obama says, well, I, I tried being the best president that I could possibly be. Early on, I was working on behalf of race relations. We have an Affordable Care Act in America. We have 20 million Americans who have health insurance now. They didn't have that before. God said, that's fantastic. Sit on my right. Donald Trump comes up. God says, Mr. Trump, 
What have you done on earth that's so wonderful that I should invite you into heaven? Donald Trump says, I believe you're sitting in my chair. <laughs> It's fun going to senior centers all through the state, and uh, I don't know if Tina told you, I, I, I don't charge anything for doing this. It's strictly volunteer work. Um, they all say the same thing. David is really not that funny. He just doesn't charge anything. <laughs> but it's really an education, and it's not just the larger towns. Some of the larger towns that I've been to, I had 160 seniors the other night in Peabody, for instance. Peabody Senior Center takes up a city block. It's unbelievable. And so is the Senior Center in Beverly and in Danvers. And Newburyport has a fairly new, uh, about a four-year-old uh, Senior Center. It's beautiful. One of the nice things about this state, you know, I, I realize you hear all kinds of conversations. And up in New Hampshire, where I live, you know, we always talk about Taxachusetts. But I try to remind people that although you pay a little bit more in taxes than we do, a little bit more, you don't pay a lot more than we do, you pay a little bit more, but you have sidewalks. <laughs> you have in most of your towns. Your, your public libraries are better, your school systems are better, your hospitals are better, you have a senior center in every town. We don't have that in New Hampshire, not in every town. I was in Plymouth, New Hampshire three months ago. Plymouth is northwest of Concord. Plymouth has a beautiful senior center. They service 17 towns. So if you live in Wentworth, New Hampshire, you drive 42 miles to the senior center. You get the difference? That's what you get in this state. And if you have a child with special needs, God help you if you live in New Hampshire. This is the state to live in. If you have special needs, services like that, you're just light years ahead of us, you really are. I hope people see this. I hope they recognize it. And you're in a, an area here specifically, I'm not gonna go on and on and on about this, but I'm gonna tell you. Number one, your senior center happens to have a terrific reputation. It's your staff that works here. Uh, and I know because I know Emmett in Boston, who is the director of all the senior centers in the state of Massachusetts. He really condones what I do. We're, we're very good friends. And he and his staff have raved about Concord. So you're in a really, really enviable place being here. There are a lot of other reasons why Concord is a wonderful place. I don't have to go into all of the reasons you already know. This is a very special area in the, in the whole state of Massachusetts as far as I'm concerned. You should be very, very happy that you're here. Speaking of uh, one of our sister states up in Maine, I have to tell you about Camden Pierce who lived up in East Vassarboro, Maine. He was wicked good when it came to carpentry. He just finished building this outhouse. He put a very fancy cherry wood seat in it. Then he varnished it. Then he went across the street to have a cup of coffee. Five minutes later, his wife come home from the mall. She had to use the facility. So she, <laughs> she went in. You could hear these screams. One of the neighbors ran to get him. He comes running over, says, what's the matter? She says, I'm stuck. He says, oh my God, it's the varnish. Well, by this time, the local fire chief showed up and he surveyed the situation. He had no choice. He had to force his way in. He threw the wife over his shoulder. He marched her out to the fire truck. Well, that provided a little entertainment for the local folks, but they rushed her right over to Maine General Hospital. They got her into the emergency room onto an operating table on her hands and knees, of course. And there were three nurses standing around. One of them yelled over for a doctor. He comes running over. She says, my God, have you ever seen anything like this before? He says, well, yes, yes, I have. But it's the first time I've ever seen one framed. <laughs> it's a little Maine humor. Speaking of Maine, I have to tell you about Alan Turner, Alan Turner lived up in Madawaska. Madawaska, Maine is way up north in, in the county. They call it the county, Arusta County. And he did business all over New England. And one day in February, he got snowed in down in Boston, Massachusetts. So he went into this hotel. 
He went up to the counter, he asked for a room. Man behind the counter says, we're full. But you go into our restaurant, you order a meal. By the time you're done, you come back here. We'll find a cot or a sofa, something to put you up temporarily. He said, all right. He went, he sat down, the waitress come over, started to take his order. She says, we have especially at the house this week, we have clam chowder. Well, he said he didn't want it. So they got the maitre d'. She came out. She started going through the menu. She says, you know, we have people from New Hampshire. They come all the way down from New Hampshire just to have our clam chowder. Well, he said he didn't want it. So they got the cook, the main cook. He comes out. He starts ramping and raving and up and down all around the menu. He finally got to the clam chowder. Well, this guy finally got through to him. You know, he didn't want it. Anyway, he ordered his meal. He finished. He went back to the counter. The man behind the counter says, you're in luck. We have a fellow up on the 17th floor. He died. You can have his room. He said, thank you very much. He took the elevator up to the 17th floor. The last thing he did, he locked his door tight. He's no fool just because he's from Maine. He reads the papers. He knows you can't trust those people down in Boston, Massachusetts. So he locked his door. Well, about 2 o'clock in the morning, he woke up out of a deep sleep. He was scared half to death. What had happened was a nurse had entered the room. No one told her that the man on the 17th floor had died. She came to give him his medicine. So she put a little night light on. She reached under the covers, popped a couple of pills in his mouth, flipped him over, gave him a high enema, <laughs> turned off the light and left. Well, early the next morning, they cleared the roads. About six o'clock, he jumped in his car. He drove up to Trapp's Corner near Oxford, Maine sitting having a cup of coffee with the boys, and one of his buddies yelled out, I understand you got snowed in in Boston. What did you think of that town anyways? He says, well, I'll tell you. Boston ain't such a bad place. But for God's sakes, if you ever go down there, don't ever refuse their clam chowder, because they'll get it into you one way or another. This one I told to a, a group when I was a, a patient at Mass General Hospital. I was uh, in Mass General for about a week before I came home. Uh, I was walking in the corridor with one of the surgeons, and we passed a room with five nurses having a coffee break. He said, tell, tell this one to them. So you know, one of my medical jokes, so I said, all right. And you could have heard them screech from, from Mass General to Concord. Um, but it's about a pastor who's talking to his congregation. He asks if anybody has thanks to give for an answered prayer. Susan Smith stands up. She comes forward. She says, we have thanks to give. Recently, my husband, Tom, suffered a terrible, terrible bicycle accident. His scrotum was completely crushed. All the men in the congregation shifted around very nervously when they heard that. <laughs> Any movements that my husband made toward me or the children caused him terrible pain. But we have thanks to give because one of the doctors was able to perform a very delicate operation on my husband. He gathered together the remnants of Tom's scrotum, wrapping wire around it to hold it in place. We are told that in six or seven weeks he'll recover. She sits down. The pastor then tentatively asks if anybody else has thanks to give for an answered prayer. A gentleman stands up and very slowly, slowly walks to the podium. He says, my name is Tom Smith. The entire congregation held its breath. I would just like to tell my wife the word is sternum. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should have heard these nurses, you know. You, you interrupt their train of thought with something like that and they, you know. I was telling them about, uh, I'm sure you all know what saccharin is about the lady in Carlisle last year who mixed up her saccharin tablets with her birth control pills. She just had the sweetest little baby. <laughs> I could have left that in New Hampshire. <laughs> Recently, my wife and I were about to celebrate our 56th wedding anniversary. So I guess the experiment has worked out OK. 56 years, woo. We were on vacation recently in Washington, DC. And we stayed at a hotel called the Watergate. And with a name like Watergate, my wife Hetty was 
suspicious. You know, it might be bugged. She wanted me to check it out. And I wasn't very enthusiastic about the idea, but I said, okay. So I looked under the bed, and I looked in the bathroom, and checked behind the pictures, and near the telephone. There wasn't any, anything anywhere. In the middle of the room, I saw a little scatter rug. So I, I moved it to one side. There was a little metal disc there with a couple of screws. I took the screws out. I moved the disc. I looked around. Nothing. Nothing. So I put the disc back. I put back the screws, and I moved the little scatter rug back on top of it. I checked around for about another hour and a half. There was nothing anywhere. We went to check out the next morning. The man behind the counter said, did you have a good stay with us? And I said, yes. Were you comfortable? Were you comfortable with us? I said, absolutely. Tell me, did you hear what happened to the couple underneath you yesterday? I said, no. What? He said, a chandelier fell on their head. <laughs> so there's a fellow sitting at home just reading, and he discovers that he's out of cigarettes. So he tells his wife he's going to the corner bar to pick up a pack. He'll be right back. So he walks over to the bar, and Jake, the bartender, offers him a beer on the house. So he's sitting, nursing it along, when suddenly this beautiful blonde walks through the door. Well, he looks the other way. He knows he has no time to fool around. Can he help it if she comes and sits right beside him, tells him how thirsty she is? So he buys her a few drinks. They start talking. They're getting very friendly. She decides she really likes him. Long story short, she invites him over to his place. How can he resist? So they go to her place. They're getting very, very intimate. The next thing you know, it's 4 o'clock in the morning. He shakes her out of a deep sleep. He asks her if she has any baby powder. She says, yeah, it's, it's in the medicine cabinet, in the bathroom. He goes in. He dusts his hands liberally with the baby powder. Gets dressed, jumps in his car, drives home at 90 miles an hour. As he's pulling in the driveway, his wife is standing there greeting him with a rolling pin in her hand. <laughs> Where have you been? Well, honey, I just went to Jake's to get some cigarettes. He gave me a beer, and I was sitting and drinking the beer. This beautiful blonde walks through the door. She comes and sits next to me and starts talking to me. Long story short, I've been over to her place all night. We've been having sex. Just a minute. Let me look at your hands. Don't you ever lie to me again, you rotten skunk. You've been out bowling all night. <laughs> the powder, the powder. You don't get it. He, he had powder all over his... You know when you go bowling, you have that powder? I think. In 1944, during World War II, there was an American soldier who was stationed in Paris, in France. And he was sitting in a room on a very comfortable sofa with his very young, very beautiful French girlfriend. She turns and she looks into his eyes and she says, Je te dois. He said, shut it yourself. <laughs> allo, allo, que ça va? When I was in um, uh, these, I go to senior centers in New Hampshire also, and also in Maine, and I walked into the uh, senior center in Berlin, New Hampshire, which is way up in the northern part of New Hampshire. I walked in, there were about 60 seniors, all of them, all 60, speaking French. It was, it's, a, it's a very interesting situation to walk in. Of course, they all spoke English. They lived there. But all of them were, you know, had parents who worked in the mills. And, and I find that also in extreme northern Maine. When I used to sell books to, I used to sell books to public libraries, including the Concord Public Library. And um, uh, I noticed that uh, when I was up in Arusta County, way up in the northern part of Maine, I, I'll never forget the time that I walked into a McDonald's for lunch just to have something quickly. And all the, everything was in French, in Madawaska, Maine, um, because they're French. 
So, and they, and they had English as well, English <laughs> subtitles, but everything, the, the big, you know, the subtitles, the big letters were, uh, were in French, so. Incidentally, I assume that you all are aware that women are far superior to men when it comes to estate planning. I have to tell you about Ken, who was a single man living at home with his father, working in the family business. And he decided, sort of along the way, that he really needed a wife so she could share in some of the business responsibilities that he had. And one evening at an investment meeting, he met the most beautiful woman he had ever met. Her beauty just swept him off his feet. He said to her, in just a few short days, my father, who's in very poor health, is gonna pass away. I stand to inherit seven and a half million dollars. Six days later, she became his stepmother. <laughs> Gotta think about that for a minute. There was a very elderly lady who lived up in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, way up in the Northeast Kingdom near Canada. She was 103 years old, going on 104, quite elderly. She was getting on in years, and she also, incidentally, was a virgin. And she was very proud of the fact that she was a virgin. She raved about it as a lifestyle to all of her, her friends, her closest friends. But because she was getting along in years, she decided to approach the undertaker in town, who was also the postmaster, very small town in Vermont. She said to him, when I pass away, I want you to have etched on my stone, born a virgin, lived a virgin, died a virgin. He said, I could do that, that's easy. Unfortunately, about three months later, she passed away. Very unfortunately, she only left a very, very small sum of money. Only enough for a tiny, tiny stone. Well, you can't fit all of that in such a small stone. I mean, this guy is going crazy trying to figure this out. He's really going nuts, obsessing over this night after night after night. Suddenly, one evening, he got a brainstorm, reverting back to the days when he was a postmaster. He knew he could deal with this, and he did. So he ended up putting on her stone, returned unopened. <laughs> anyway. Oh, I wanted to take a quick break for a few seconds and tell you about a very special place in this state. And it's perfect because it's off of Route 2. I send a check every year to a very worthy organization in Massachusetts called Trustees of Reservations. I'm sure you've heard of them. They oversee some of the nicest places anywhere that you can. Did you ever hear of Cranes Beach in Ipswich? That's one of the places that they maintain. And they have places all over the state, from Boston West. And I'm gonna tell you about a place which I think is very special. Those of you who are mobile, which looks like all of you, you can walk around a little bit. You, if you enjoy nature and you enjoy the peace and quiet and beauties of nature, this is a special place. Raise your hand if you know where South Royalston is. Okay, we got about five hands. If you were to go out Route 2 west and go, go through Westminster and past Gardner, you'd get to Athol and Orange, okay? Somebody... You were born there, okay. <laughs> Athol, incidentally, has a terrific senior center. <laughs> but there's a town next to Athol called Royalston, and Royalston is very, very rural. Woods, it's just woods with a few people but there's a place there called Doan's Falls. Did you ever hear of the old Doan's Pills? Yep. Spelled the same way. What you should do, do yourself a favor, when you go home tonight, access your smartphone or your computer and access Doan's Falls, Royalston, Massachusetts. D-O-A-N-E-S, Doan's Falls. What is it? You park your car, you walk in, 
and you see and hear a waterfalls. And it's a very nice waterfalls. The waterfalls empties into a river which is down below. It's way down below. They even have steel cables for you to hold on to so you don't get dizzy looking down because it's quite a drop. And you can follow the river along. You can go into the woods. You can walk a mile or two if you want, or you can walk 300 yards. You can do what you want. The, everything is marked so you, you don't get lost. You don't have to worry about crowds of people because nobody's heard of Royalston. It's not like going to, um, what am I trying to think of? Uh, Thoreau, Walden Pond, where you have to hunt around for a parking space because everybody goes there. This is a place, it's, it's in the woods. You have this beautiful river. On the other side of the river, there's a big lake called Tully Lake. Tully Lake supplies the drinking water for the city of Worcester. And they have picnic benches. And if you were to go on a weekend, you would see lots and lots of grandparents and great-grandparents having lunch with their grandchildren and great-grandchildren. You can also swim and boat on the lake, but the main thing is to go there and sit and have, have lunch. So I'm mentioning it because we're right on Route 2 in Concord here, just about. If you go out Route 2, it's, I don't know, an hour from here? I don't even know if it's that much. For me, it's almost two hours where I live. For you, it's much closer. I recommend that you go maybe when the foliage changes. You'll see some color. If you go in the next month or two, my only suggestion is to bring bug spray. <laughs> you're in the woods. And when I say you're in the woods, you're really in the woods there. It's, it's just, that's what it is. But it's beautiful. It's, it's some of the beauties of nature, as I say. People think of Massachusetts as Lowell and Lawrence and Haverhill, and they forget that if you go a little bit to the west, and you don't even have to go west, there's plenty around here that's beautiful also. But it's a very special place. I've had three directors of senior centers call me at home thanking me for mentioning Doan's Falls because they had some of the of members of their groups go out there. The way to do it is four or six of you get together in an SUV, pack a lunch, and go out and make a day of it. It's a nice place to walk around, peaceful and beautiful, and it's just, just plain fun. So I wish you luck with that if you go. It's nice. I saw a sign on a plumbing truck today on the way over here, and it said, a flush beats a full house. <laughs> I thought that was cute. Anyway, <laughs> what they don't think up. Um, I had a couple that were handed to me recently that I wanted to, uh, to read. Uh, I told you about the lady in the house. Um, I also wanted to tell you about a mother superior recently who was walking down Boylston in Boston, Boylston Street in Boston. Coming toward her was a young girl. They hadn't seen each other in years and years, and they screeched and hugged and embraced. The, the nun looks at her and says, tell me, my dear, what are you doing with yourself these days? The young girl says, I'm a prostitute. The mother superior says, what did you say? She says, I'm a prostitute. She said, oh, thank heavens. I thought you said you were Protestant. <laughs> There was a, a Roman Catholic priest who was sitting in a doctor's office reading a newspaper when suddenly this red-faced nun comes running out past him. He stands up and he, he goes and confronts the doctor. He says, what did you say to that woman? Doctor says, I, I told her she was pregnant. Why would you say such a thing? Well, it sure cured her hiccups. We had an incident in um, Manchester, New Hampshire recently. There was a teenage kid who was sitting on a brand new Harley Davidson motorcycle that his father bought him for Christmas. And he's sitting at a traffic light waiting for the light to turn to green. This 96-year-old gentleman, little gentleman, pulls up right beside him in a little moped. He's looking at the bike. He says, oh my god, what a beautiful bike. Could I look at it? The kid says, sure, why not? He doesn't care. Anyway, the, the light turns to green. This kid takes off in a hurry. Before you know it, he's up over 50 miles an hour. He checks his side view mirror. He sees a little dot. 
And the dot seems to be getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and whish right by him at supersonic speeds. He doesn't pay any attention, he doesn't care, he keeps driving. He looks straight ahead into the horizon, he sees this dot coming toward him again, very fast, growing and growing and growing and whoosh, right by him. He checks his side view mirror a second time, and again he sees this dot gaining on him, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Before you know what happens, wham, right into the back of his motorcycle, knocks this kid off, he picks himself up, he dusts himself off, he looks down on the ground. This little old gentleman is down on the ground. He looks at him, he says, sir, I'm so sorry. Is there anything I can do to help you? The little old man looks up and says, well, could you please disconnect my suspenders from your handlebars? <laughs> I have to tell you that there's a very famous flight school in mid-Arizona. And at this flight school, they train fighter pilots from all over the world. This particular morning, I mean, they, they come from everywhere, from Europe, from the Middle East. And this particular morning, there were two gentlemen that this flight instructor was teaching. One was a young Israeli soldier. The other was a gentleman from Egypt, an Egyptian. After they made their initial introductions, he took them up to 3,500 feet. He opens the door. He points to the Israeli, he says, you're first, jump. The Israeli jumps out, he pulls his ripcord, and he's floating down through space. A Couple of seconds later, he turns to the Egyptian, he says, you're next, jump. The Egyptian jumps out of the door, he pulls his ripcord, it doesn't work. He pulls his emergency cord, it does not work. He's flying through space. The Israeli looks up and he sees this Egyptian coming toward him at supersonic speeds. Just as they get dead even, the Israeli grabs onto him for dear life. The Egyptian looks at him and says, Sir, I do not know why you are saving my life, because I hate you. Our country hates your country. We are going to kill you. We are going to push you into the sea. Why are you saving my life? The Israeli says, <laughs> There was an, uh, an older married couple, they were celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary by vacationing down in Florida. And they were in Key West, Florida for about a week. And after checking out all of the uh, better places to eat and the art galleries and museums, they decided to drive north to the mainland. The very next day they see a sign, big sign, which says, welcome to K-I-S-S-I-M-M-E-E. -E. She says, it's Kissimmee. He says, no, honey, it's Kissimmee. And they're arguing about this. I think they'd have something better to argue about. Arguing, bickering all morning into the afternoon. Finally, she says, honey, you know what? This is getting a little bit old. We're getting hungry. We're getting tired. Let's just drive into town. We'll talk to a local. We'll get something to eat. And we'll settle this. He says, OK. So they pull up to a fast food place. This fellow comes from behind the counter. She says to him, sir, we're having a little disagreement. Can you tell us very slowly, where are we? And how do you pronounce it? And he looks back at her with one slightly raised eyebrow. He says, Burger King. <laughs> So I have to tell you about Sophie and Sarah. Sophie and Sarah were two elderly Jewish women. They made an agreement that if anything happened to one of them, that the other one would keep in touch through a seance. Sophie passed away. Sarah was sitting in this dark room. She says, Sophie, Sophie says, Sarah, is that you? She says, yeah, that's me. What's new with you? She says, well, I get up in the morning, I have a little salad, I have a little sex, I take a nap. I get up in the afternoon, I have a little more salad. I have a little more sex. I take another nap. She says, oi, it sounds like heaven where you are. She says, heaven, I ended up as a rabbit in Tucson, Arizona. <laughs> so. 
you know, when I go to senior centers in Maine, especially when I'm in, around Augusta, or no, I can't tell jokes like that. I can't tell you about the Mother Superior. The Mother Superior, that one they get. But you, you don't get ethnic when you get to Maine. This is when I was uh, um, implying before that you're in a special area of Concord. One of the things which sort of goes unsaid, I didn't mention it, but I will now, I could say almost anything to you. It could, they could be Italian jokes, Armenian jokes, Greek jokes, whatever. It doesn't make any difference. You all know what planet I'm coming from, because you're in Concord. Your, your exposure here is nothing like your exposure when you get 40 miles west of Worcester. It, I mean, it's beautiful out there, but it, believe me, it's a different country. And I mean, I happen to like Western Massachusetts very much for a lot of reasons. I noticed that they do not really nutty things there. They, they stop for stop signs. <laughs> they signal, you know. But, but you know what I'm getting at. I'm getting, I'm, I'm simply implying that this is a very sophisticated area, and it really is. And um, so you have exposure to all kinds of things that other people in other areas in New England don't have. Let me tell you a, a very, very quick story. I'll make it brief. This is an experience that I had about 30 years ago when I was up in Maine selling to libraries up in Maine. And one afternoon, it was lunchtime, I was outside of Turner, Maine, and I went into this little takeout restaurant. It was takeout, but they had places to sit. They seated about two dozen people, so it was pretty good sized. I walked into this place to have lunch. Everybody in the restaurant, it was full. Everybody was buzzing. I went up to the manager and I said, what's going on? Why is everybody so excited? What happened was an African-American man in a big car with Massachusetts plates drove up to this takeout restaurant just to get something to go. He, he went in, he picked up his food, and he left. That was it. Everybody was buzzing. Why? They had never, ever seen a real Negro person. They have newspapers, they have TV, and you can't, you can't imagine that this would happen in the United States of America. You, you could almost laugh about it, except it wasn't funny. They were just, they weren't saying anything negative. They weren't being negative. They were just fascinated because they saw one. This is a little town in Maine, and you, know, you, you tell this to people, and it's, it's almost difficult to believe that that would happen. And I, I never forgot that. That's what I mean by exposure. Um, I, I visited a, a regional high school there one day, and the guidance director told me this was Nokomis High School in Pittsfield, Maine, which is next to Newport, Maine. And he, had, uh, he told me that they had a large group of juniors and seniors from their high school make a, tr a field trip to Boston. And most of these kids had never been out of their town before. A couple of them had been to Portland, the rest of them had never seen more than a three-story house. They went to Boston. One of the experiences they uh, partook of, they went to the Science Museum. He said that their kids spent 45 minutes riding the elevators. <laughs> you're 16 years old. You've never been on an elevator. What are you going to do? You're going to ride the elevator up and down, up and down, 45 minutes. You know, it's, it's comical, and yet, uh, that's the way it is in, in some of these far-reaching places where they simply don't have the exposure. I'm going to try a little um, game for a second. I want you all, for a second here, to pick a number, any number, don't say it, just think of a number in your head from 1 to 10. And I want you to multiply that number times 9. Now, if you have a two-digit number, Add the two numbers together. For example, if the number was 61, it would be 6 plus 1 is 7. So think of a number from 1 to 10, multiply it by 9, and if you have two digits, add the two together. Now subtract 5. All right, whatever number you're at now, I want you to pick the letter of the alphabet that that number would correspond to. 
One would be A, two would be B, three would be C, okay? So pick the letter of the alphabet that that number corresponds to. Now I want you to think of the first country. It has to be a country that comes into your mind that begins with that letter. Okay, the second letter of that country, second letter of that country. Think of an animal that begins with that letter. Think of what color the animal might be. Do I ask you if there are any gray elephants in Denmark? Oh my God. Did you get, raise your hand if you got, oh wow. That's fabulous. How did he do that anyway? How do you do that? I don't know. Okay, um, I'm going to uh, end with, I have a couple more. This is about a senior, senior citizen on his 88th birthday. He says to his buddy, I understand you're getting married. <laughs> yep. This woman that you're going to marry, is she good looking? No, not really. Is she a good cook? No, she doesn't cook very well. Does she have a lot of money? No, she's, she's as poor as a church mouse. Is she good in bed? I really don't know. Then why in the world would you marry her? Well, she can still drive at night. <laughs> this is called the memorial stone. This is about a woman who lost her husband who had $30,000 to his name. After everything had finished at the funeral home in the cemetery, she told her closest friend that none of the $30,000 was left. How can that be? Her friend asks her. The widow thought about it and said, well, the funeral cost me $6,500, and of course, I made a donation to the church for $500. I spent another $500 for the wake, the food, the drinks, you know. The rest of it went for the memorial stone. Her friend was astonished. $22,500 for a memorial stone. My God, how big is it? The widow replied, Three carrots. <laughs> so, so um, this is about two men who were sitting next to each other at a bar. After a while, one guy looks at the other and says, you know, I can't help think from listening to you that you might be from Ireland. The other guy says, yes, I am. First guy says, so am I. Where about in Ireland might you be from? The second guy responds, well now, I'm from Dublin, I am. First guy says, sure in Bogora, so am I. Tell me, what street did you live in in Dublin? The other guy says, well, it was a lovely little area in the old section of town. I lived on McCleary Street. The other guy answers, oh my goodness. Tell me, what school, what school would you have been going to? The other guy says, well, now I went to St. Mary's, of course. The first guy gets really excited. You went to St. Mary's? So did I. Tell me, what year did you graduate? The other guy answers, well, now I graduated in 1964. The first guy exclaims, the good Lord must be smiling down upon us. I can hardly believe our good luck at winding up on this very bar at the same night as you. This is unbelievable. Can you believe it? I graduated from St. Mary's in 1964, my own self. About this time, another fellow walks into the bar. He sits down and he orders a beer. The bartender walks over, shaking his head, muttering, it's gonna be a long night tonight. The Murphy twins are drunk again. <laughs> so, so. And last but not least, this is about Jacob, Jacob who is 96 years old, and Rebecca who is 94. They're living in Florida. They're very excited about their decision to get married. They go out for a, a little walk one day. They're discussing their upcoming plans for the wedding. They find themselves right in front of a CVS pharmacy. So Jacob goes in and he talks to the man behind the counter. Are you the pharmacist? Pharmacist says yes. Jacob says, we're about to get married. 
Do you carry heart medication? Of course we do. How about medicine for memory problems and arthritis and jaundice? Yes, we do. We have a large variety. We have the works. What about vitamins and sleeping pills and Geritol and antidotes for Parkinson's disease? Absolutely. Jacob says, tell me, do you, do you sell wheelchairs and, and walkers and portable commodes? All speeds, all sizes. Good, said Jacob. We'd like to use this store as our bridal registry. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for inviting me. And I want to remind you again, I have no ulterior motive for this. I don't, uh, you know, the trustees of reservations are all, all volunteerism. You have nothing to lose. Check it out. Check out Doan's Fun. And a couple of you in the back here know what I'm talking about because you're, were you born in Athol? Where were you born? I was born in Athol. In Athol. I've been there for a while. I'm back now. I've lived in different states in my country. And my daughter said, Mom, you know, you're getting up there in age, you've got to come back. So she and her husband paid for me to move back here. Have you, ever, have you heard of Doan's Fun? Well, what happened? I was in high school, and we went, it was not, and I was afraid it was not big, big like it is now. And we'd stand up there like that, and I'd say, oh my goodness. It was oh dangerous. My goodness. It's, yeah. it's dangerous. I'm not, somebody pushed me in, and I went right down. Thank goodness, I went straight down, and I was able to get up on the rock and then climb back up. And yeah. go. Well, now, as I say, now they have steel cables. It's, it's a lot safer. Yeah. So there's no, there's no danger at all, but it's, it's quite a beautiful place. And um, yeah, it's worth it. It's worth checking out. So go online. If you go online, you'll see some visuals. You'll see what I'm talking about. And then if you decide, a few of you get together and make a day of it. But it's, I mention it because it's not a well-known. I could have talked to, to you about the gorge in Chesterfield, another nice place. Uh, Purgatory Chasm in Whitensville, maybe you've heard of that. Yeah. But, but the um, Doan's Falls, I think, is really, really a lot nicer. It's, it's a really a beautiful place. So check it out, see what you think.